our distinguished chief guest, Sri Vijay Pasalkar, convener of the Pravuddha Bharat, Chaitanya Kulkarni, co convener Sachin Sabnes, who is also my host for today. And uh, respected citizens of this great city of Belagavi. I'm grateful to Prabhuda Bhar uh, Bharat for this opportunity to speak on a very important topic. He has the title given is uh, Intellectual Terrorism. And in fact, this is something that needs to be understood. There is a physical terrorism and there is an intellectual terrorism. Till the year 1100 AD, we were considered the most developed country of the world. People from all over the world used to come for not only buying goods in, uh, from our country, but to learn, to get spiritual advancement. And then we faced an onslaught of Islamic forces, and that fighting that took us 800 years. And following that, at the weakest moment after a debilitating 800 years, the British arrived with new weapons and then they imposed what they called as the Christian values on our country. India has never, traditionally, even when we were 100% Hindus, never believed in imposing its religion on anybody. The best examples of that is the two minorities who were persecuted everywhere and came to India for refuge, the Zoroastrians, who we call as Parsis, <coughs> and uh, the Jews, were persecuted all over the world. And they themselves have paid us tributes. When the British left India, they asked the Parsis that you are such a small community, this mass of Hinduism will swamp you out. So we would like to give you reservations as we, gave, we have given to the Anglo-Indians. And the Parsis said, for a thousand years the Hindus looked after us, we don't need you, you better go and we'll be looked after. And the Parsis are there everywhere, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, like Manik Shah, the Air Force Chief, Fali Major, Attorney General, Sori Sorabji. There are Parsis everywhere, there are just about 60,000. But they have never, ever accept, expressed gratitude to the Hindu community for looking after them. The Jews were persecuted, butchered, they came to India, mostly in Cochin and Bombay. We built them their synagogues. And when Israel was formed, they left for, many of them left for Israel. And Israeli parliament, after adopting the constitution, passed a resolution which said, thank you, India, the only country which did not persecute the Jews. Today we are getting lectures on intolerance. The most tolerant community, which believes all religions lead to God. Is there any other religion outside India, which was not born in India, which says that, does the Islam say that all religions lead to God? No. If you don't believe in Islam, you are a kafir. Either you convert or get killed. That's there in the Quran. The, the Bible says that if you do not believe in Christ, 
you are possessed by the devil and fit for destruction. Hindu religion and along with it, it's the religions born in India as a, as a, as a reform religion like the Buddhism, Sikhism and Jainism, they all accept that the paths to God are multivarious. And that is the foundation of tolerance. Terrorism is what? It is to overawe the population, to do what they don't want to do, and not to do what they want to do. In Kashmir, they want us to give away Kashmir. This is something we will not do. Gone are the days when these things, these slogans could be imposed on us. We accepted partition, but even in partition, if you look at the the bill passed by the House of Commons, the British Parliament, they say in the discussion that the idea is to create a Muslim-governed Pakistan and a Hindu-governed India. It is we Hindus who said, no, we will not require anyone who is not a Hindu to leave India. Ambedkar was, Dr. Ambedkar was for, for an exchange of population between Hindus and Muslims. But ultimately we decided in the Constituent Assembly that we shall be a country, we didn't use the word secular, secular came later, Jawaharlal Nehru's contribution, <laughs> because we don't know what it means. In mathematics, it just means a straight line going upwards. But what does it mean in a society to say secular? I still not understood. Sarva dharma samabhav, in Sanskrit, I can understand. So, therefore, secular came, the word secular was put in not into the constitution, but in the preamble of the constitution in emergency when we were. Parliament was functioning as a captive parliament of Mrs. Gandhi. Where there is nowhere else in the constitution where the word secularism is defined. On the contrary, all the things that are dear to Hindus is in the constitution. Ban on cow slaughter. People give me lectures, how can you dictate what I will eat? It's my fundamental right to eat anything. Sorry, that's not what the Constitution says. All fundamental rights are subject to reasonable restriction. And when the Constitution, Article 48, says that there shall be a ban on cow slaughter, you will have to agree to that. And it is not a question of intellectual terrorism. I am not making anyone do what you should not do, nor am I in favor of not allowing somebody to do something they want to do. But it should be within the constitutional framework. Alcohol is also banned under Article 49. Uniform Civil Code it is there in the Constitution, Article 44, giving primacy to Sanskrit in the development of Hindi is in the Constitution, Article 351. Adoption of Devanagari as a common script in addition to your mother script, mother tongue script, is there in Article 340. And it says preservation of our ancient heritage, that's there in the constitution. And yet, there is a new school which has emerged, which is telling us, particularly the Hindus, 
that you are being intolerant and you are being exclusive instead of inclusive. This country fought 800 years Islamic terror. Although Shivaji had Muslims in his army, so did Guru Gobind Singh, but they came as individuals. It was essentially a war between Hinduism and Islam. And the Islamic rulers made it absolutely clear. But the fight we never gave up. Iran was captured by Islam when it was, Iran was Zoroastrian, the Islamic forces went to Iran. It was called Persia in those days. Conquered it in 15 years. They converted 100% of the population of Iran to Islam. Neighboring country of Mesopotamia, Babylon, they conquered it in 17 years, they converted it to 100% Islam. Egypt was conquered and Islam converted Egypt into 100% Islam in 21 years. The Christians conquered Europe and converted Europe into 100% Christian in 50 years. In India, 800 years of Islamic rule, 200 years of Christian rule, and yet we are 80% Hindu even today. Because the war continued throughout India. Whether it's Chhatrapati Shivaji who got us victory, or whether it's Rana Pratap who instilled courage into us, or whether it's the Vijayanagar Empire from Hampi Asinapur near Bijapur, which, by the way, spread for 300 years up to the borders of Bengal, and brought in a renaissance. But look at our history books. One, one chapter for each Mughal Raja. <laughs> Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb. But Vijayanagar Empire, one small paragraph. That in South India there was something called Vijayanagar Empire. Some books don't even have. Ask our students, do you know what India Vijayanagar Empire is? Very few people know outside perhaps Karnataka. Rani Chennama, nobody has heard of her. <laughs> Guru Gobind Singh and his father sacrificed Guru Tegh Bahadur. A home dynasty. The people from uh, Thailand came, settled in India, adopted Hinduism, formed the Ahom dynasty. The Mughals twice tried to cross into Burma but they were beaten black and blue by the Ahom dynasty and couldn't go. And the same thing with the, the British rule. But there's a difference. The Islamic rule was physical force. The British rule was based on what is called as brainwashing you to change your outlook. The first thing that Macaulay advocated is that Sanskrit be scrapped. Sanskrit is a language that collects the whole of India. Every language of India has Sanskrit words. Some more, some less. Bengali has 80%, Malayalam has 75%, Kannada has 60%, Marathi has 70%, Tamil has 41%. And Tamil is almost as old as Sanskrit, but yet it has 41% words. Once I told Karnanidhi this, he said, no, no, this is all nonsense, this is all Aryan Bakwas. Tamil is a pure independent language. In fact, he believed that there was something called Dravidians all over India, and then the Aryans came from Europe via Khyber Pass, and then drove the Dravidians to the South India. Dravidian was a separate community, he said, for a long time. He even said that Ravan was the real god of the Tamils. And that north is run by the Brahmins. 
I told him that Ravan was also a Brahmin. <laughs> it's a fact. And I also told him he's not from Sri Lanka. He's not a Tamil. He was born in, the, in an area called Noida near Delhi. And that village is still there for you to see called Bisrak. They put a board there, Ravan was born here. He went to Kailash, got a boon from Lord Shiva, and went and conquered Sri Lanka. For a long time, Tamil Nadu under Karunanidhi used to celebrate Ravan Leela. But finally got convinced and uh, he gave up Ram, uh, Ravan Leela. Nowadays, you don't have Ravan Leela in Tamil Nadu. <laughs> but on Sanskrit, he has been very clear. I won't allow it. And he kept on saying there's no Sanskrit in Tamil. Finally, I had to ask him, but your name Karuna Nidhi is Sanskrit. <laughs> Karuna and Nidhi. So this is the brainwashing that the British did. That we are not one community. Today, modern science of DNA says we are all of one DNA. Published in, if you don't believe in University of Mysore's Journal of Genetics or the American Houston University's Journal of Genetics, you can look at the Cambridge University Journal of Genetics. All Indians have the same DNA. Whether it is North Indians, South Indians, East Indians, West Indians. Whether it is Brahmin, Scheduled Caste, same DNA. There's no difference. The scheduled caste population came as a special situation. Unfortunately, by then we got birth connected with the Varna. As Lord Krishna says in, in Gita, it has got nothing to do with birth. It has got to do with your gunas. We venerated knowledge and sacrifice at the highest. Jnana and Tyag. And those who practiced that were called Brahmins. Vishwamitra's father and mother were, shat were Kshatriyas. But by his actions, he became a Brahmin, a Maharishi. Veda Vyasa's mother was a fisherwoman. He became a Maharishi and wrote the Ma Mahabharat. Kalidasa was a Vanvasi. He used to cut the branches of trees. Became the biggest poet of India. He was a Maharishi. Valmiki was a scheduled caste of parents, his parents were scheduled class, became a Maharishi after a brief career as a dacoit. So therefore, there's got nothing to do, we are one people. But the intellectual terrorism, intellectual terrorism today, making you believe what you should not believe, or not believe what you should believe, that has made us to think of all us as different people. Even our languages are connected by Sanskrit. That is not acknowledged. Sanskrit is a dead language. It's not a dead language anymore because it is the language of the future. In the NASA, there's a journal called Journal of Artificial Intelligence. It says, in future, artificial intelligence will grow into a big computer science and it will be storing knowledge in the computer and the most appropriate computer-friendly language on this earth is Sanskrit and it will be stored in Sanskrit. <clears throat> you can Google and find out that there is a school called St. John's School in London, one of the finest schools. And they teach young boys and girls from the ages of 5 to 11 to recite for the first half an hour of the school Sanskrit shlokas. I couldn't believe it till I went to London and checked. And I was told that the principal is of the view that if you recite certain Sanskrit shlokas, the vibrations in your body will make your brain develop much faster than can for us. <laughs> but what are we being told? These are all ancient. Hindus who say, I'm a Hindu. If you say Hindu, then you must say, but I'm not communal. That also you must add. 
<laughs> I'm a Hindu in practice at home quietly, but I am not a communal person. And you see this everywhere. Macaulay had said, make the mentality of an Indian in every aspect except his skin color, an Englishman. Should wear Western dress. Nothing wrong with wearing Western dress, but he said, wearing Indian dress, you should then have a prejudice. If you come with wearing Indian dress, there's something wrong with you, or you're a fanatic, or you're, you're somebody who wants to overthrow the British rule. And his manners, use of folks knives, all these, he said, should be prescribed. Englishman in habits, Englishman in morals, Englishman in attitudes, but Indian by looks. This is what Macaulay said and this is what we created this breed. Mahatma Gandhi, Savarkar, and many other intellectuals who propagated. You should read Dr. Ambedkar's article. I feel sometimes shocked to find that right from 1954, when the first, first Bharat Ratna was awarded, to 1990 when the Janata came to power, again 1991, Dr. Ambedkar was denied a Bharat Ratna, despite of him having piloted and drafting committee of the Constituent Assembly and produce the Constitution of India. Why? Because Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru didn't like it. He, in fact, had once said that Sanskrit may be an ancient language, but it should not be taught anymore because it's become irrelevant scientifically. The first Bharatantana was given to Jawaharlal Nehru. I was a minister in 1990-91, so Mr. Chandrasekhar said, who should we give Bharatana to? Just then, the earlier year, we had given to Ambedkar. Then I was shocked to find in 1991 that Sardar Patel also had not got the Bharatana. So I went through the files, I found the 1954 file when the Bharat was instituted. Jawaharlal Nehru puts on the file, I, Jawaharlal Nehru, hereby award Jawar, Bharat Ratna to Jawaharlal Nehru <laughs> and approved by Jawaharlal Nehru, Prime Minister of India. <laughs> Sardar Patel's name crossed out, crossed out, crossed out, all through. So the Janata government of Chandrasekhar with me as senior most minister, we gave it to Sardar Patel for the first time. Now the, <laughs> now the congressmen say we are appropriating Congress leaders. They were national leaders. Congress died several times after, 19, after the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi who wanted to liquidate, dissolve the Congress. It died and then splits when the, all the stalwarts were thrown out of the party by Mrs. Gandhi. So, there's no Congress only in name. Now it is not even Indian National Congress, it's the Italian National Congress. <laughs> so, therefore, this whole idea, secularism and uh, tolerance, and inclusiveness is part of a new baggage to terrorize you. There's a Gandhian, I mean Indira Gandhian, not Mahatma Gandhian, but Indira Gandhian, intellectual called Ram Chandra Guha. He says there's no such thing as a right-wing intellectual. In other words, there's only left-wing intellectual. What is this left-wing, I want to know? Our chief guest has talked about the wonderful progress made by China. I have studied China very, very deeply. I'm considered a friend of China. Although, because I speak Chinese, the Chinese say there is a phrase 
which every child is taught in China, which in Chinese says, goes like this, Tian Pu Pa, Ti Pu Pa, Jiu Pa, Yang Gui Zi, Wei Shou Zhong Ha. Means do not fear the gods, do not fear the devil, but do fear the foreigner who knows how to speak Chinese. Because it's such a tough language. They have completely given up communism as far as the economy is considered. The growth rate of China, when they had socialistic pattern of society or socialist socialism as their economy, was the same rate as when India was having socialism. Three and a half percent per year. Between 1950 and 1980, both India and China grew at the same rate. China gave up socialism in 1980. India did not give it up till 1990 when Mr. Chandrasekhar and myself formed a new government. And then Narsimha Rao took it forward. And our growth rate then went up from 3.5% to 8% because of economic reforms. But this 3.5% per year was entirely due to socialism. And the same thing you can see when you look at Germany. West Germany, after partition in 1945, adopted market economy. It became a developed country in 25 years. East Germany adopted communism, socialism. And in 1990, the Berlin Wall broke and they became one Germany, and you can go to Germany and see how backward East Germany is. Same thing with North Korea and South Korea. South Korea has adopted market economy far ahead economically than North Korea. China gave it up in 1980 and started accelerating. Whatever gap they have with India today is during that 10-year period when we were still sticking to socialism and China had given it up. China is politically a communist country, but economically, it is, you have to go and see how much freedom there is to, to transact business. As long as you do not get mixed up in politics, they are very, very friendly to those who want to invest. So Chinese growth is a proof that controlled societies cannot grow. Today, we have this situation where our society requires unification. We are under threat from terrorism from outside. But we are also in, in a sense within our own country. We are still discovering ourselves. Are we a Hindu country? If the word, if the meaning is, are we a Hindu religious country, that is, we believe in Sanatan Dharma and nothing else? No, obviously not. It cannot be. We never were. We all through never accept the time of Buddhist rule and Ashoka's time, never said that the king shall be of, uh, king shall, the king shall be a particular religion till Islam came. Buddhism, for a brief period, had that clause in its constitution. So, this fundamental principle is that we claim to ourselves to be a continuation of the past culture of India, which is largely Hindu. They say no other religions have also contributed, maybe. When Ganga flows, lots of small rivers keep joining, but the name Ganga never changes. <laughs> Culturally, we are Hindus, which means we believe in the law of karma. We believe that all religions lead to God. We believe in our relationship that we have between father and son, mother and daughter, husband and wife, we believe in the family system. This cultural thing is something that was sought to be, dis uh, to be disrupted 
and there's a lot of fossilization that has taken place, and that we have to change. And that is why we, you have started propagating the word Hindutva, which is originally give, the word coined by Veer Savarkar. Savarkar wrote one of the most brilliant history books called the 1850, of the 18, the first war of independence, 1857. What did the British call it? Mutiny. And gave, said all kinds of rubbish that, you know, people didn't like pig fat or cow fat or something like that. It was a rebellion which was all over India. People revolted, not in Meerut for the first time. At that time, the first rebellion came in Vellor in Tamil Nadu. And it spread all over the country. It was supported by the, by the farmers of India. And the British, after, abling, uh, after being enabled to crush this rebellion, this revolution, the first war, they systematically went after the farmers of India. Today's poverty of the farmers is an outcome of not only the British, but after this, because of the socialist planning of 40 years, 1950 to 1990, and the neglect of agriculture as a growth sector of the country. Agriculture has been just been given subsidies, but we have never treated it as a, as a growth sector. It is, in fact, a growth sector. The growth sector, it's not fashionable because socialism talked about heavy engineering, big plants, seal plants, this plant, that plant. But agriculture as an engine of growth, even today we don't have that concept. Just how to help the farmers not commit suicide, that's the total concern that we have today. But remember India, it is the only country, large country in the world which can grow crops all 12 months of the year. United States cannot grow crops all 12 months of the year because snowfall is there for five months. No agriculture can be done. Europe, the same thing. Three-fourths of China, you can't do agriculture because for three months there is snowfall. But India, for 12 months you can do. That means you can grow three crops. But we are only on 25% of the land growing more than one crop. The price of rice, price of wheat, price of uh, vegetables, flowers, is the lowest in the world. One-sixth the price of basmati rice. The basmati rice is an equivalent in Japan. It costs six times more. Wheat in America costs four times more. Milk. The price of milk is one-eighth in India compared to Europe. We have 150 million cows and now Bos Indicus breed. Why did our ancient people say preserve this cow? It's a special breed called Bos Indicus. For some reason in America it is called a Brahmin cow. I don't know why. Is it a term of praise or abuse? I don't know. But it's called Brahmin cow, uh, Brahmin herd, H-E-R-D. Its milk is now put in containers under the name A2. You can go to the supermarket in America and see that it costs four times more than the ordinary milk. Why? Because the Americans admit that this cow's milk is medicinally far superior to any of the other milk. That's why we don't... That's why we said that it should be pro protected. Of course, there were certain other things also which went along with it. Cow dung could be used as fuel. The urine had medicinal values. Well, I mean, people get revolted with the idea of having to drink milk, but let me tell you, one-third of the drugs produced in the United States Urea is taken from public urinals and used in producing the medicines. Please go and check the ingredients, you will get it. It's okay to take urine from public urinals as long as you don't know it, but not from the cow. 
So this cow, 150 million cows, but they give only 200 liters per year because of the nourishment that they have. An average Israeli, Israeli cow will give you 11,000 11, liters per year. So imagine if 150 million cows give you 11,000 liters per year, I'll come to Belgaum swimming in milk, that much milk we'll create. <laughs> you put this in cold storage, pasteurize it, put it in a bottle, make it a part of a carton of A2 and uh, export it to Europe, for which you'll have to fight in the WTO because they have put barriers. Agriculture is your growth sector. But it's infra dig to speak about it. The part of the atmosphere created with this Soviet influence in our India is industrialization. Yes, we need industrialization. But that industrialization also, you have to do it in a careful way. I have been targeted by all these liberals because I convinced the prime minister and got sacked Mr. Raghuram Rajan from the Reserve Bank Governor. <laughs> he was just raising interest rates every day. He's not an economist. He has a PhD in finance, but finance is not economics. Finance is microeconomics, but policy is macroeconomics. Macroeconomics, you push a button here, the effect will be felt somewhere else. Microeconomics is bilateral. I buy and sell depending on the price and availability and supply. That's bilateral. But economy is a general equilibrium system, which Mr. Raghuram Rajan didn't understand or didn't want to understand. He kept raising the interest rates, saying I want to control the inflation. And when this was told to me that this is the logic in which he's doing, I said he sounds like a doctor who couldn't bring the temperature down, so he killed the patient and said, I brought the temperature down. <laughs> Small industries, the cost of capital went up. Americans learned this in 1925, when the United States president called all economists and said, there's too much un unemployment in the country. How do I cure that? Economists at that time, with their knowledge that was available, said there is one way, convince the labor unions to reduce the wage rates, the wages, the minimum wages. And then there will be demand will grow up for, for the labor and unemployment will go down. So the president did that, United States, 1925. But what did he find? After the wages came down, unemployment increased. He couldn't understand it. He called the economists, they couldn't understand it. Then there was a worldwide conference, or rather Europe and American conference, where finally it was agreed that what had happened is that raising, the lowering the wage rate also reduced the purchasing power of the labor force, and therefore the demand had gone down. Because the demand had gone down, companies started closing, and therefore unemployment started increasing. The same thing here with the, with, the, uh, uh, with the interest rates. You raise it, cost of capital of small and medium industries uh, goes up. They can't afford it anymore. The NPAs grow. They close down. And then what happens? There's a depression. That falling of temperature is like the patient dying. It, the depression produces lower inflation. So this was it. But look at the intellectual terrorism in there. A lot of people, there was one fashionable lady in Bombay who phoned me up and screamed at me, how dare you get rid of Raghu Ram Rajan? So who are you? She gave me her name, Shobha De. <laughs> so I said, what do you do for a living? She says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a well-known person. I said, all right. But what is so likable about Mr. Raghu Ram Rajan? She said, he's so handsome. <laughs> so I said, is that a qualification for, for, uh, for Raghu Ram Rajan? for a reserve bank governor. I'm telling you, even the United States president recommended Raghu Ram Rajan. And it's to credit of our prime minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, he didn't lilt. <laughs> so this is how our economy is being disrupted. But to raise questions about it, 
I am not defending everything the government has done. I have openly, publicly opposed the implementation of GST. GST. I have openly opposed the, the software aspect of Aadhaar. I am not afraid to speak. But my party is democratic enough to allow me to speak too. <laughs> Which uh, Congress party doesn't understand. <laughs> because they declared the emergency and then they are giving lectures to us on what they call as tolerance. What tolerance they showed in the emergency. And what is their qualification? Ms. Sonia Gandhi, has she passed fifth year in a school? No. But for a long time in her affidavit, she was saying she studied in Cambridge and got a degree in English, till I got a letter from the registrar that there was never any such student. <laughs> and then the speaker of Lok Sabha asked her, why did you give this in that case? She said it was a printing mistake. <laughs> so I told the speaker that time, Manoj Joshi, please send this to the Guinness Book of the World Records for the longest printing mistake in world history. <laughs> Same thing with Rahul, he has never passed an exam. <laughs> but he says he got an MPhil from Cambridge. They are both on bail. They give us, talk to us about tolerance. But look at the corruption they have done in National Herald. 5,000 crores worth of property which belonged to the National Herald Company, Associated Journals, Private Limited. They forced it to close it down and give the reason that they cannot pay 90 crores of debt which arises out of loans they got from the Congress party. So for having 5,000 crores of property and not being able to pay 90 crores is ridiculous. But they closed it down saying that the National Health, that uh, Social Journal said, we can't pay this, and the Congress accepted it, that this, this, in a, this loan now, this debt has become dud. Then a new company is created called Young Indian, of which 80% of the shares is owned by mother and son, that is Sonia and Rahul, 10% each by the remaining 20%, 10% each of Motilal Vora and uh, Oscar Fernandez, he's from your state. <laughs> now, this young Indian has only five lakh rupees worth of uh, paid up capital. And it has a board meeting and says that Motilal Vora should negotiate with Congress that since they cannot recover that loan of 90 crores, therefore, Congress party is given 50 lakh rupees by Young Indian as compensation for transferring that dud loan or dud debt to Young Indian. That is, Congress party can't collect that debt, that's what they say. So, as compensation, they say, you assign this debt to us and we'll become the owners of that debt and you will get 50 lakhs, otherwise you'll have zero. So Congress party is convinced. Motila Lora was very good at argument. The Congress treasurer was completely impressed. His name also was Motila Lora, by the way. <laughs> and then they went to Young Indian, uh, to National Herald, the Associate Journal, and convinced the board of directors that they should give nine crores worth of 10 rupees each new shares, which means 99. 99.1% of the total shares and assign it in the name of Young Indian. And the chairman of the board of directors is also Motilal Vora. So Motilal Vora spoke to Motilal Vora, treasurer of Congress party, and then spoke to Motilal Vora. And got it. Is this not fraud? And they're giving us lectures for tolerance, for vendetta. And the court all the way they went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court didn't listen to them. They are out on bail. Now we have some fight going on between me and them over documents. Because I have found that the Associated Journals Private Limited never got any loan according to the account books. 
And Congress party never gave any loan according to the account books of the Congress. So I'm asking for the accounts uh, books. And they are not giving, they are all the time finding some way to adjourn the matter, but not very long. I hope uh, by next uh, summer, uh, both uh, all the entire family of Congress will find, will be state guest in Tihar jail. I don't know whether you have heard this, but there is a problem. Because on 7th November, I am expecting that in the 2G verdict, Mr. Raja and Kanimuri will go to jail. Then after that, Chidambaram and his son <laughs> on the air cell maxis. So the TR jail superintendent is known to me. He told me, see, you got to be a little slow on this. I said, why? <laughs> he said, because all these madrasis come and ask for idli and dosa. And the TR jail, Babarchi can know, knows how to make alu puri only. So, therefore, do it slowly so that he can learn. I said, what happens if an Italian comes and asks for spaghetti and... <laughs> for all the attacks on the BJP, has the Congress been able to file even one small case against any of our ministers? <laughs> not one. They say so many things about Mr. Narendra Modi, but they are not able to say anything wrong he has done. So therefore, this itself shows that there is a new era. And that new era of Relative clear. I'm not saying that we have solved all the problems of corruption. There's a lot to do. There's 120 lakh crores abroad in foreign accounts. We have to bring it back. We'll bring it back. But the fact of the matter is that for the first time, you have a relatively clean government which, on which there is not a single charge. <laughs> I'm talking with the central government, and this will filter down soon. But I also say, that therefore today they are attacking us for what they call as intolerance. Hindu terror. In Tamil Nadu there's a new fellow who's... Uh, all these cinema stars when they, their career starts failing, they enter politics <laughs> and become corrupt. And he's giving a lecture of Hindu terror. They say to me, don't say Islamic terror. Because this is not Islam. But all terrorists who I say is Islamic terror quote the Quran. You may say they quote it wrongly or wrongly interpreting it. Quran says kafir is one who doesn't believe in Allah and Islam and the, and the Quran. And therefore either he converts or he should be killed. It's there in the shlokas of the Quran. I'm not, I mean, it's there. I mean, I'm not criticizing that. It's there. That's all. So, you say, no, no, that is not real Islam. Islam is a land of peace. Maybe, but they say it is Islam. But as far as Hindu terror is concerned, not one person has been able to say whether in the Vedas or in the Upanishads or in the Gita, it says, kill people who don't believe what you believe. So how can you call it Hindu terror when they are not quoting from any Hindu scriptures? It's just a bunch of mad people who may be, who may be congressmen in disguise for all I know. <laughs> because many of the times we have investigated a matter, we found it's not Hindu terror. It has not got anything to do with Hindus at all. In, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the neighboring part of Delhi, in uh, Badurgad, about two years ago, they said that a Harijan family was burnt alive by Hindus. After that, and that time, the uh, uh, Akhilesh Yadav was the chief minister. I mean, this Badurgad, excuse me, that is Haryana. That time, Mr. Huda was the uh, uh, chief minister. And therefore, they said, blamed it on us Hindus. Later on, the investigation showed that it was a Dalit family 
which had a fight amongst themselves on property and one section burnt the other section down. Never came in the press. Today the press is also doing selective publishing. They will never follow up things. In Kerala, RSS people are being targeted because they are going for Hindu consolidation. This is scaring the hell out of them. So they are killing our uh, young people, actually hacking them to pieces, butchery. But nobody talks about it. And I don't know why they are doing it, these CPM people. They are in such small numbers in the rest of India. If the RSS also took the same approach, there will be no CPM left anywhere in the rest of India. <laughs> but we believe the rule of law. But they will not compliment us for that. They will come up with some, somebody objecting to some cinema. Hindus have done it. The, the Hindu, what the Hindu intolerance is growing. Intolerance is what? Well, intolerance about what? What have we, have we prevented anybody from speaking what they want? Has anybody been sent to jail for saying something against the BJP or the RSS? They will spread canards and canards. Mahatma Gandhi was killed by RSS. Which commission inquiry says that? Jawaharlal Nehru said it. But Jawaharlal Nehru is not uh, the final authority. And most of the things that Jawaharlal Nehru said were on the instructions of Edwin Mountbatten. Yeah, she told him that we must build a secular India. We should be grateful to Britain for putting us together. We are one country for long years in our history books. It says that we were never one country. The British put us together. Manmohan Singh went to Oxford and said, we Indians are grateful to the British because they taught us English. Well, they, may, they have nothing to do with today's English. Because English has become an international language, not because of the British, but because of the Americans. If the Americans had adopted German, we will all be speaking in German today as an international language which we want to learn for science. So, if today we say the history books should be rewritten, they say it's intolerance. What does the history book say? We are Aryans and Dravidians, that's rubbish. You take the DNA, you, you can see it. We are all one people, we didn't come from anywhere. There's no record of Aryans coming from Khyber Pass. Similarly, they say that uh, uh, the re leaders of Islamic, um, uh, uh, you know, of Islamic kingdoms were humane. Tipu Sultan, he fought the British. But he fought the British because he got money from the French to fight the British, and not because the British had to leave India and they were torturing Hindus. <laughs> so these distortions we want to remove. Our history is a glorious tradition of fighting for the integrity of India. So therefore, today, don't feel put down by those who say intolerance. Lack of inclusiveness. What lack of inclusiveness? We, in, we BJP people, we RSS people, we Vishwanarish people, we are trying to bring people as much together as possible. Why did we win the 2014 election and why we are going to win the 2019 election, 2024 election? <laughs> it's because we are uniting the Hindus. The Congress strategy from beginning was divide the Hindus on caste basis, language basis, regional basis, and unite the minorities. We decided the process of Hindutva, we will try to unite the Hindus. In that, we also found that there were sections of the minorities who were ready to come with us. Women of the Islamic community said, if you remove triple talaq, we'll vote for you. In UP recently, in the assembly election, we did not put up a single Muslim candidate. Not a single. Not because we didn't want to. We didn't get any. There was a boycott. So we put up no Muslim candidate. People said, you are finished. 
Because in, uh, out of 404 assembly seats of UP, there are 125 seats which are Muslim dominated and you will lose all of them. We won 85 of them. And why? Because the women of the Muslim community voted for us. And they're going to continue voting for us because now they're asking for uh, inheritance rights also and we'll give that also. <laughs> we have believed in, Hindus have believed in gender equality for ages. Ever since our religion began. Thousands and thousands of years. Look at Brahma's cabinet. All the important portfolios are with women. Defense is with Durga, finance is with uh, Lakshmi, <laughs> education is with Saraswati. <laughs> what have the male gods got? Nothing. <laughs> Information broadcasting for Narad Muni. <laughs> we have had women warriors, Jani, Jhansi, Rani, Chennama. We have had we have women who have played major roles in, in uh, precipitating a war for revenge. Draupadi, if it wasn't for Draupadi, there would have been no Mahabharata war. Look at Sita, when Hanuman went to her and said, Rama is crying for you, please come with me, sit on my shoulder, I'll take you to Rama. She said, no, this man has, uh, Ravan has enslaved so many women, I'm not going to come for myself. Rama must come and kill Ravan and liberate these women, then only I will come. And that's how Ravan was killed. And if women decide to play negative also, they can be terrible. <laughs> like Kai Kai, you see. Manthara convinced her and she went on a war path. So, women have had that position. We lost it because of the foreign invasions. We are restoring it. I am telling the minorities, you cannot have second class status under any circumstances. You are equal to men. This is an age of knowledge. It is no more an age of physical strength. Women and men are equal and we will fight for it to see that it happens. <laughs> and there is a lot of atrocities against women. But I want the women also, you should learn some karate. So that anyone comes near you, you can give him, kick him and throw him, you know, send him flying. Women should learn the art of self-defense also. It's not that men should protect them. So that process is continuing. So now what's happened? Now suddenly in the Ram temple matter, the Shias have suddenly woken up and said, this masjid, Babri masjid was really a Shia masjid. I was surprised to hear that. So I looked at the records, yes, Babar was a Sunni, but the commander-in-chief of Babar who broke the Ram temple and built a masjid, Babri masjid, it was, uh, Babri by the way is not the name of Babar, huh? it's the name of a seven-year-old boy. Why it was given and all, I'm not going to it just now, because it'll get me into some big controversy. Uh, later on sometime I will tell you, but anyway, Babri Masjid was built by Mir Baki, who was a Shia. He appointed a supervisor, which in, in Arabic is called Mutwali. Mutwali is hereditary. So we traced the Mutwali, and we found that he is living in Ambedkar district next to Ayodhya. And we got hold of him, and then the Shia Waqaf board suddenly has filed a new petition saying that this is a Shia masjid and we Shias, we have cooperative relations with Hindus. Masjid can be built anywhere. Please build us a masjid where Shias live and that is in Bambetka district and Ram Janmabhumi will be for Ram temple. <laughs> Rajdeep Sardesai says instead of temple we should build a hospital. I'm not against building a hospital across Saryu River for the benefit of uh, Rajdeep, <laughs> but it will be called a mental hospital, not a physical. <laughs> we are not against Muslims. We regard them, the damn DNA us. 
which means that Muslims are also their ancestors are Hindus. So India, Hindustan is land of Hindus and those others whose ancestors are Hindus. And if the Muslims accept that, privately they accept it, but the mullah doesn't accept it because then there is a problem of uh, having control over them. If Muslims accept it, they become part of the family. And we'll defend them, look after them, see that they get equal rights. But if you come, think that you are descendants of Gori and Ghazni, and then you are the enemy. This is what I want to say to them. What is wrong in that? This is a suggestion. They are saying all kinds of things. And I will also say that wherever Muslims are in majority the in world over, there's no democracy. I don't blame them for them because that the ideology doesn't believe in that. It's a very strict, disciplined community. Saudi Arabia, no democracy. A Qatar, no democracy. Um, uh, Yemen, no dis uh, democracy. Pakistan, no democracy. The Bangladesh is tottering, its Bengali influence is waning, now it's increasing Islamic, uh, uh, you know, uh, Islamization is leading to uh, a failure of democracy. Malaysia is gone. Uh, Indonesia is different. They, in fact, in their currency, 10,000 rupee note, they've got Ganesha in it. So I asked the finance minister of uh, Indonesia, how come you put Ganesha there? Their airline is named Garuda, by the way. We say Air India, but they say Garuda. Anyway, why you put Ganesha there? He said once the, in 1997, the currency was devaluing very fast. And we didn't know how to stop it. Everything was collapsing. So somebody came from Bali and said, if you put Ganesha's photo, it will stop. <laughs> so he said, we have tried everything, nothing works. So we said, all right, this also we'll try. And we printed 10,000 rupiah, rupiah note with Ganesha there, and the fall stopped and it started going up. <laughs> in Jakarta, in Jakarta, the capital city, in the main corner, you have, you have uh, 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 a chariot, of Lord Krishna giving Upadesh to Arjuna. So th that kind of Islamic society, we have no problem. Culturally with us, theologically with Quran, that kind of Islam we will promote. But what we need today is everyone, every Hindu says, I am Hindu first, then only I am Brahmin, Kshatriya, and so on. And those who can protect this heritage of Hindus will get preference over anything else. All these economic problems you are having, we'll fix it. I remember we were growing at 3.5% per year, and there was an agricultural crisis. Lal Bahadur Shastri became prime minister. In two years, he brought green revolution, and today we don't have any problem of having to import food grains from abroad. Same thing with growth rate, Narsimha Rao adopted economic reforms. Of course, I supplied him the blueprints. He had the courage to implement it. We grew from 3.5% to 8%. Economy can be turned around quickly, but this country must get back the glory of its old civilization, the united Hindu civilization in which others live as equal partners. And that is where you should be careful of those who intellectually try to overpower you to think what you are not or think, not think what you are. You are all one people of this, uh, this subcontinent called Hindustan and we are one people. All these caste barriers and all are artificial. They were brought in originally for a different purpose of division of labor. We are one India. That is the way to defeat intellectual uh, terrorism. That is the right way of going about it. Right means we may be called right wing or anything, but the focus is the cultural renaissance of India. That is the right response. Thank you very much.